Everybody knows pretty much what that's about. We're going to just read verse number 30. 1 Kings 18 and verse number 30. The Bible says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near. And he says at the end of this, He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Amen. If you're standing, you can be seated. Thank you for standing for the word of God. The word, I want to talk this morning on this thought. The consequences of a neglected altar. The consequences of a neglected altar. The word neglect means to pay no attention to or little attention to. To disregard or slight. To remiss in the care or treatment of. To omit through indifference or carelessness. To fail to carry out or perform. To fail to take or use. So, as I begin to look at this and I begin to impress upon me the neglected altar. As we begin to move into our new house a few months ago on July 22nd, I realized as I was walking through the house, there are two places in the house that are just plain creepy. And one is an attic and one is a basement. And unless you have a finished basement, basements can be a pretty uh, creepy place to be. In the house that, that we had bought, it was a uh, what I would consider kind of a creepy basement. It had the, you know, the dark gray flooring, the cement floor, the walls were kind of all messed up. There were spider webs hanging all over the ceiling and hanging from this. And when you, I would walk down the stairs, I would get a face full of spider webs, which is disgusting enough as it is. Being as tall as I am, I seem to get this a little bit more than the average person. I'm only 6'2", but it seems like I always walk through those spider webs. So I'm walking down the stairs, and you get a face full of spider webs, and and when we get to the bottom of our stairs, there's a cement wall in front of you that you can turn left or turn right, and there's an entryway to the back part of our basement. When I would walk into either doorway, you know, I was trying to do one of these things. As you're walking through the basement, so I'm trying to get my hands to block the spider webs so they don't hit me in the face or hit me in my, my body. And so I was doing this as I was walking forward, and then pretty soon, you know, you walk through the doorway, and there's another face full of spider webs. As I would go throughout and from the pipes to this chain and from this pipe to this wire and from this to this and all over the basement, there was just spider webs everywhere. It was just, it was nasty. So as we were moving and we were getting stuff done, my mom was kind of just wandering around uh, wanting something to do. And so I said, take a broom and go sleep in the basement. Just get the spider webs out of the ceiling, get them out of the doorways and just do that. That's going to be your job. Because we were already, we had enough help on loading the truck and, and we had some people cleaning some of the rooms because the people that we bought the house from didn't bother to clean the house. So we had a lot of people helping us clean. And so I said, you know what, Mommy, if you would just go down and attack the basement and take the broom and swing that thing around and get the spider webs out of there. And so she goes downstairs and it didn't seem like she was down there that long, but she came upstairs she's like, I'm done. I'm like, okay, there's no way that all the spider webs are gone. But okay, Mom, whatever, that's what you think you did, then cool. I felt like I was a parent, she was a child. The table was finally flipped after all these years of me saying I was the sort of right weren't done right. And so I didn't go down to the basement, but then a, a day later, you know, as you're undoing boxes and you got bins, I start walking down to the basement. And pretty soon I would look up and I had a face full of spider webs again. And I look and there were spider webs once again from the, the duct work hanging to this cord and hanging to this chain and from one corner of a doorway down to the other side, and I'm walking through them again, and I'm thinking, what in the world is mine? Did she even clean this thing? You know, so I'm taking the broom, and I'm going back through, and I'm sweeping every, through every board in the ceiling, through every bit of ductwork, everything I could do, I just swept everything. And I didn't want to walk through any more spider webs. And so the day went on, and it was successful. I didn't have any spider webs in my face. And then sooner or later, the next day came, and the spiders were back. And it was, it's a non-stop thing. I'm down there sweeping again. So I'm tired of getting fed. It's disgusting. It's sticky. And if you hit them right, it seems like after they just spit them or whatever, it just sticks to you that much more. And it is just a nuisance and it's annoying. And so I began to sweep. Well, then my wife and I, we determined that right away we were going to paint the basement. So we bought some paint and we painted the walls a nice white color. We painted the floor a, a tan color to light it up a little bit so it's not so creepy. We want a creepy basement. One of the places where we knew we were having our second kid, and if Ben wanted to, you know, throw himself against the wall, he'd do it in the basement. But I wanted it to be at least a decent basement, at least white walls and, and you know, a decent floor and, you know, whatever. Hopefully not full of spider webs. But one thing I begin to notice about this basement is I don't have to sweep spider webs anymore in my basement. Because once we began to paint it, then we were going down there a little bit more often to unload 
boxes or go down to get a box and bring it upstairs and unload it and all this. And then Ben decided that he was going to go downstairs and play soccer. And so because it is just a cement wall, he goes down there and he kicks the ball against the wall. He likes to score goals and runs around and plays football and all that stuff in the basement. So you get to realize that the more you use an area, the less, the more it's not neglected, the less it's abandoned then the more likely it is that the spiders are not going to be there. Because spiders live in places that are neglected, in places that are abandoned. You don't see a spider web right in the middle of your hallway because you walk through there many times a day. It's not going to build a nest there. Usually the spider webs in our house now, we've got 10-foot ceilings, and so you can see little spots in the corner of a 10-foot ceiling where there's a spider web because we don't go up there. We have no use for that corner where I'm not 10 feet tall. If I raise my hands, I'm not 10 feet tall, so I'm not even close to scraping it. So a spider knows where to live. It lives in neglected areas. It lives in abandoned areas. Areas that we pay little or no attention to. Areas that are disregarded. Areas that are remiss in the care of. That is where spiders begin to dwell. And so once we begin to fill the area, and once we begin to use the area, then the spiders are not there anymore. My son doesn't come up to me now and say, Daddy, you've got to sweep the floor because there's a spider. Or I squished the spider on the wall. Or, Daddy, look at this. I put my ball on it. And the spider webs are stuck to the ball. He doesn't have that anymore because we're using an area. It's no longer neglected. Amen. So we find that spiders as well in these neglected places. They put webs around what well, begins to happen. So let's go back. Let's go back to our text in 1 Kings 18. We find that if you know the story, that there is a showdown on top of Mount Carmel. And there is uh, the prophets of Baal and Jezebel, which is the queen at the time, and King Ahab. They're saying that Baal is God, and they're, he's the all-powerful, this golden image that they had made. And Elijah is saying, no, that the God that we serve is the real God, he's the true God. And so they decided that they were going to have a showdown. They were going to meet on Mount Carmel, and they were going to make two altars. The altar to Baal, and then an altar that was made to God. The Bible says that they were going to make a sacrifice to the God that would answer by fire. Let that be God. You have to read the long story. And so we find that as the altars were being built, that Baal had got to go first. And Baal, while they were making, the prophets were making this altar, and they put the sacrifice on there, that they were singing praise, and they were worshiping this idol. And of course, no fire fell. They began to pray. They began to cut themselves. They began to scream. They began to do all of these things, but yet still no fire fell. Elijah begins to mock them, you know, the story, you say that God's on vacation, is he sleeping, you know, what's your problem, maybe he just doesn't want to hear you right now, maybe you should cut yourself a little bit more, you know, just kind of really playing it all a little thing for them, and of course we know that the fire never fell, because we know that you cannot serve any other God but the one true God, and so fire never did fall from the altar. But we find that in our text in 1 Kings 18, that Elijah begins to prepare the altar, the Bible doesn't say that he built a brand new altar, but the Bible uses the term that he repaired an altar. That word there, you got to understand, if it's repairing something, that means that there was something there at one point. It was being repaired. It wasn't that he built a new altar. This altar that was there was something that, that they had worshipped at before. This altar that he was going to sacrifice off of was something that the children of Israel had visited before. It was an altar that was already prepared for God. It was an altar that already had sacrificed. It was an altar that already did all of those things. But yet we find that it was broken, that it needed repair. What begins to happen is over time, maybe at one time, they started out just so in love with God and in the sacrifice and in the prayer that they quite frequently. Maybe they started out on a daily visit, on a daily journey to that altar and sacrificing like they were supposed to. But maybe as the cares of life came up and family situations came up, maybe they didn't visit that altar quite so frequently. And so maybe an everyday visit becomes an every other day visit. And an every other day visit becomes a twice a week visit. And then the twice a week visit becomes a once a week visit. And a once a week maybe becomes a bi-weekly visit. And then, you know, I'm getting that. Then it's a once a month and have your sins roll back another year. The altar wasn't as important as it once was at the beginning of their relationship 
they would have built the stone and then put it back together. Had they noticed that the foundation was cracking, they would have put some mortar in that thing so it wouldn't have broken. But we find that this morning that Elijah had to repair an altar, an altar that never should have needed that type of repair. Because in my mind at this point, I doesn't say in the Bible that it was you know neglected for years, but in my mind when he begins to repair this thing. It was something that might have been neglected for a little while. It was something that, that just, just, just people just didn't care about anymore. They were careless about. One thing we've got to understand in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verses 12 through 14, the Bible says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And we love verse number 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, which was laying on the hands of the presbytery. The word neglect there means to be careless. In other words, what Paul is telling Timothy is don't be careless with the gift that is within you. You were given the Holy Ghost. You were given truth. You were given charity and faith and purity. But he says don't be careless with it. Don't neglect it. Don't put it on the shelf and don't abandon it. Don't allow that part of your life to be destroyed and therefore overcome with spiders or overcome with weeds. you got to understand that if you don't use the Holy Ghost and if you don't use the Spirit of God, you're going to worship something. If you're not giving your time and your attention to God in your altar and your prayer life, then essentially what you're doing is you're abandoning the altar of God and then you're serving the devil because you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to be at the altar of God or you're going to be at the altar of Baal. But we find too often that when people try to go back and get their life straight, the first thing they have to do is repair an altar because their life they have neglected the things of God. They've neglected doctrine. They've neglected their prayer life. They've neglected fasting. They've neglected worship. They've neglected praise. And the altar has broken down and therefore their life has broken down. Because the state of your altar will determine the state of your life. The state of your altar will determine the state of your life. You say, well, how do you know that? Israel was not in the right place with God because their altar was broken. You can read all throughout the Old Testament when the altar was repaired and they began to sacrifice and they began to pray and seek God that they got on the right track and they were in the right direction and the power of God flowed and the blessings of God flowed. But when the altar started to get neglected and when the altar started to be careless and when we started to not care as much about that, then you can see the spiritual climate of Israel just begin to go into the tank and then they wonder, God, where are you? God, why are we not blessed? Why are we not winning any battles? And God said, where is the altar in your life? What condition is the altar in in your life? And you go back and you visit that place and you realize the bricks have fallen down. The foundation has begun to crack. I'm here to tell you the devil wants nothing more than to ruin the altars of God in your life. He wants nothing more than to ruin your prayer life, to ruin your worship, to ruin your giving, to ruin how you act and how you talk and how you think. How you treat everybody. God, the devil is out to want to ruin all of that stuff. But Paul said, I've taught you charity. I've taught you purity. I've taught you righteousness. And don't neglect the gift that is in thee. You've got to go and visit that frequently. You've got to go and make a daily sacrifice at the altar. You've got to get up and pray without ceasing. You've got to get up and have communion with God every single day. Because when you think you can do it on your own, and that altar gets neglected, it's not long before it begins to crumble. When it begins to crumble in your life, it's crumbles to No man despises you. Don't no neglect the gift that is in thee. Because what begins to happen, Matthew chapter 12, 43 through 45, the Bible says that when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walked in through dry places seeking rest and finding none. Then he say, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth an empty swept and garnished. Then goeth he, taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, that they may enter in and dwell there. And the last day of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Now let's begin to break this thing down. The word empty, when he says the spirit goes out of the man, and he comes back and he finds it empty. Empty means to take a holiday in that text in the Greek. To take a holiday or to be at leisure for it. To be empty or to be vacant. So he finds this house, this 
temple that is now empty. It's big. It's been taken a holiday. It's, it's empty. It's then it says he finds it sweat, which means literally to sweep. Well, that's a rocket science of wisdom right there. Sweat means to sweep. Garnish, to put in order, to decorate, specifically to adorn, garnish, to put or trim. So we find that, that when somebody is possessed with the devil, what he's saying is when they leave, when that devil leaves this person, they're going to walk around in dry places. But then the spirit is going to come back. And what condition it finds the temple at, and the house at, is determining whether he's going to stay or not. Because the Bible says that yes, this person was delivered, and this person was set free. The spirit was out of this person that was wandering around in dry places, seeking rest without finding any. So he says, I'm going to go back to the house that I came from. And the Bible says that he finds it empty. It's vacant. There's nothing there. It's swept. It was swept. They cleaned it out. And it was garnished. It was adorned. So what, what, what are you trying to say here? This is a person who is trying to get right. Once had a devil. Once had infirmities. Once had issues in their life. But when that issue or that devil got out of them, the devil wanders around and says, I wonder if that person has neglected God yet. I wonder if that person has turned their back on the thing that cast me out. I wonder if that person is, has gone back, if they're still in love with that thing, if they're still in love with God, if they're still in love with prayer, if they're still in love with fasting, or if they're not. So he goes back to visit you, and he says he finds it empty. It's vacant. In other words, you haven't replaced anything yet. It's still empty. You haven't replaced the prayer life. You haven't put worship in there. You haven't done all of these things. So he finds it almost in the same condition that it was when he left. So he says, fine, I'm going to go get seven of my buddies, and we're going to move in together. And the state of that person is worse than the first. Why is it that you find that with backsliders, it's always harder to come back to God. It's always harder to reconnect into the mind. It's always harder to get the prayer life going. Because when you neglected him once, then seven times more comes on your place. And it gets that much more difficult. You have to rebuild and alter in your life. You've got to fast even more than you've ever fasted before. You've got to pray harder than you've ever prayed before because now the box is coming in. What begins to happen, now I'm not a gardener, you all know that, but my dad is a big gardener. And we know, I know from growing up that when you begin to pull weeds, if you don't maintain the garden, it's not too long before the weeds pop up everywhere. I just was really moved into our house in our backyard on the right side, between the sidewalk and the fence, there was some mulch there, there was some plants. So I began to go through, and the day I was just bored, and I never think I would be bored enough to weed, but apparently I was. So I sat down and just began to pull weeds out of this flower bed. Just began to pull, I had a big old pile, went through this whole thing, and it looked real nice. You know, so we talked about maybe we should buy mulch and this and that, but you know, the summer was winding to an end, and fall was coming, and you know, what's the point of it? You know, putting bolts down, it's going to snow, it's going to be buried anyway, leaves are going to fall, you know, it's a big deal. So we didn't do anything. And a few weeks, of, a few days even, of not even paying attention to that area, and then the weeds, the posse came. It's like those Weezenex commercials. You know, and it said, you know, that big mucus guy comes in, and then all of a sudden the people are doing the little, you know, conga lines, and they're busting in the person sinuses, and he said, hey, let's move in. And, you know, the Weezenex gets them out, and they start talking and acting, and they go out with you know, then Houston, that's all these germs are starting to get to have a party in your nose and in your bronchial tubes and in your lungs. And pretty soon they're doing the common line. But if, if it's not, if it's neglected, if it's abandoned, if you're not taking care of yourself, if you don't have something in there, then, then it is going to come in. We could have put a weed killer down to help satisfy the area of the garden, but we didn't do that, so weeds came back. We could have put mulch down to help cover it a little bit longer so the weeds wouldn't pop up, but we didn't do that, so the weeds came up. We could have put that little tarp thing down on the, on the ground and then cover that with mulch so the weeds would have to bust through that and then come through, but we didn't do that. We neglected this area because we neglected it. Weeds began to pop up everywhere, and all of a sudden, it's a lot worse than that. I don't remember it being this bad, but it gets even worse. We've got to make sure that we do not neglect the altars of God in our lives, the things that God has delivered us from. The, I don't ever want a spirit or a trial or a test to come back and find me in the same shape as I was when it left me. But I wanted to know that when I come in, that when it leaves and it moves out, I'm going to make room for God. And I'm going to set up a couch and a table for God so God can come into my heart, into my mind, because the Bible so if all this person had to do was just open the door and let God in, he says, I want to suffer with you, I want to die. 
one thing I've noticed, my dad has taught me over the years, is it's easier to maintain than it is to constantly redo or rebuild something because it's been neglected. Like a marriage. If a marriage, if you neglect your spouse, if you neglect your partner for years, it's a hard thing to try to prevent that marriage. It's a hard thing to try to get together. But if you have daily maintenance, daily talks, daily nights, love each other. It's like working on a car. If you drive your car on the ground and you ignore the oil change, and you ignore the you know, transmission flush, and you ignore the serpentine belt, and you ignore some of these basic routine things. I don't think about cars. I hope those are routine. I know what oil changes. Outside of that, figure whatever, you know, whatever the thing tells me to do, I do. So, you know, if you don't do the routine things, if you don't change the oil, the oil runs out, what happens to your engine? I'm assuming something's bad. I was looking for an answer there. I wasn't trying to give you one. I was looking for something. Huh? So you blow something. See? And then what happens to your car? It doesn't work. And you got to go, and instead of getting a $30 oil change or $15 or spending 30 minutes somewhere or having somebody do it for you or whatever, now you got a couple thousand dollars fixed on your hand. All because you didn't do routine maintenance. I remember when we were younger, our sister Aubrey did that. She didn't change her oil. And it was in that, that brown car that we had, or whatever that was, the Sundance. And then I know my dad was ticked. He was like, which left time you change your oil? Why didn't know my dad to? So, you know, we wouldn't be happy with her about it. But we learned something about routine maintenance because the $30, $30 oil change at that Jiffy Lube or the Instant Lube or you go to Jiffy Lube for $14.99 or whatever, it's a lot more convenient than having to spend a couple thousand dollars and not having to buy a new car because your car is so old and junky, you put more money into it, it doubles the value of your car, so you just buy a new one. All these things begin to happen because of neglect. I don't want my car to be neglected, so I have to do the routine thing. We just took my wife's car in for a routine checkup. It ended up costing a lot more than I wanted to. Seems a lot not very routine at that point. If you want to acknowledge me the door, if they want to acknowledge the door, if they didn't do it right, it's not like that. You can't neglect these things. The fire of God fell when Elijah came and prepared the broken down altar. It was broken down. Excuse me. And in fact, that's what the Bible even says at the end of 18 and 30. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Let me just ask this question. How many people in their lives today, this is rhetorical, I'll need to answer. How many people in their lives can honestly look at the state of their altar and say that it's in tip-top shape? And say that it is the place of pristine condition where the power of God wants to dwell and God wants to dwell there. If the answer to that is, my altar isn't that way, then today's a good day to begin to rebuild. Today's a good day to be like Elijah and begin to put some stones together and begin to make some mortar. It's going to take some sweat equity because now you've got to repair something. Now you've got to, you know, almost like the Israelites back in ancient land, you've got to put mortar and straw and you've got to make some mortar. You've got to put some bricks on top. You've got to rebuild it. You've got to hold it in place while the mortar stays. It's going to be a lot of sweat equity, but you can get your altar rebuilt and you can get your life back on track so the blessings of God can flow and the favor of God can be in your life. It's going to take a little bit of effort. It's going to take a little bit of time. And for those of you that say your altar is in pristine condition, let me just tell you, you're a liar. I don't mean that really to be money necessarily. I know it is money, but you're a liar. Because any one of us that thinks our altar is in pristine condition, you're just deceiving yourself. Because it's never in pristine condition. You have to constantly, daily, I have to daily go to my altar and put work into it, Brother Titus. I have to daily come here at the church office or I pray in my home or in my car or wherever I'm at. I have to daily Go. I have to die. This one also. I die daily. I have to daily go to the altar and lay myself down. I have to daily check the foundation because it's not long that the foundation begins to crack. It's not long that the water begins to get in there. And then, you know, as it begins to expand and contract through the weather conditions, because we all know that our spiritual temperature, we're not always 100% on fire for God. There's going to be some temperature fluctuations. There's going to be times of lukewarmness, and there's going to be times of cold. And it begins to freeze. And then it begins to go. And then it begins to bust. And the foundation gets even more cracked. And it gets more messed up. And then it thaws out. And more water gets in. And the process, and pretty soon the whole thing is messed up. you got to make sure that daily you're visiting your altar. And daily making sure that I am on fire 
different about you. I need to know what this thing is. And so they told them about the gospel and the Holy Ghost. They took them into a room and they prayed this girl through with the gift of the Holy Ghost. She began to speak in another tongue. The first before one service had even started, how did she know there was something different? Because I believe they had an altar that was built in their life. They, when they got, I believe that they were praying and they were fasting, saying, God, let my life line up with what you need me to do. Let me be a light and be a witness. And while they were just walking by their own business, somebody felt the fire. And somebody knew there was something different about them. And so she said, I need to know what that is. I need to feel. I need to feel that on the inside. And so they began to build an altar in her life. And when the altar was built and they led her through repentance, then the fire of God fell and she received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you that the fire of God always falls when somebody has an altar built correctly in their life. And it's going to do more than touch you and touch your family, but it's going to touch a lost and a dying world. Because when Elijah built the altar and he repaired the broken down altar, he wasn't the only one that got blessed, Brother Elvish. But everybody that was there saw the fire. Everybody heard the fire call. Everybody saw it and everybody felt the heat of the fire. And so then you know there was a big showdown and they slew the prophets of Baal and everybody started serving God. But what happened to the state, the spiritual climate of Israel? Right back up to his feet. Because they had an altar. They had a prophet in their life. And the fire began to fall. Let's all stand together today, just a couple of minutes early. Well, listen. These are the consequences of a neglected altar. A neglected altar brings fires, bring webs, which we read that you can be entangled again therewith. And the end of it is worse than the beginning. A neglected altar brings not the blessings and the fire of God, but rather it causes frustration and confusion in your life because you are not hearing God. God works and operates through a properly built altar. And the consequence of the neglected altar is there's no fire. And where there is no fire, there is no spirit moving because the Bible says our God is a consumed fire. So if, this, if the fire is not falling, that means God's not here. And if God's not here in our services, why are we here? If God doesn't show up on a Sunday when we're gathered together, why are we here? I could be sleeping right now. I could be stuck in my face. I'm hungry. I could be doing that right now. There's a lot of things I could be doing right now. But there's something about coming in when there's fire. When we gather together, I want every person, every saint to feel the fire. How do we, how do we get the fire started? Let's start by going to the prayer room before service. Amen. Let's start by getting to the prayer room before service. Let's get the fire kindled. Let's get this thing going. So when people walk in the door, they know, man, there's something different about this. There's just, when the guests walk in the door, they need to know there's something different about this church. And there's, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to say, but I just, I feel something that's drawing. I just feel something is going to happen. And there's that old song, I just feel like something good is about to happen. When people walk in the doors, I want them to know, hey, something good is about to happen. What, where does it start? It starts in a prayer room. Actually, it starts in your house. When you get up, why don't you give God praise? When you get up in the morning, why don't you thank Him for the breath of life? And then I got up this morning, and my, my son wasn't awake yet, and I went downstairs, and I turned on some tight trivet, and I just began to have a little church time downstairs in my living room and my dining room. I wanted to get the fire of God started in my life. I had a rough week. I wanted the fire of God to move in my life. And so I began to go down there, find myself in a prayer room, and just get the fire started, get that fire going. So when they come in here, amen, when people come into the sanctuary, it's the warmth of the Holy Ghost. They feel a drawing of the Holy Ghost. So when, like, like Sister uh, Amy Hess's, uh, Sister Floyd's husband that came on Tuesday, he came believing for a healing in his back. Why? Because the fire had fallen in Sister Flora's life. She was baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost in a prayer meeting. And he said, you know what? I worked 14 hours a day, but he made time. Now listen, he said, I don't come to church because I don't have time to come to church. But he told me Tuesday night, he said, I made time to 
The fire causes a life change. The fire causes dedication. The fire causes commitment. It's the fire that draws you closer and wants you to hang out just a little bit longer. Just like when you're at a campfire. You don't want to leave the campfire because it's warm. When you get up and you turn your back to the flame, then it's all you get that cold blast of air right in your face. I'm here to tell you, I put a tent stake up right by the fire. I'm going to be as close to the fire as I can possibly get because I want to see miracle signs and wonders. I want to be used of God and I don't want to have the consequences of a neglected altar. Come on, can we worship the Lord? I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I feel like the fire of God is wanting to fall in this place here today. Hallelujah. And when the fire falls, it consumes everything that's not like the fire. No, you got sin in your life, let the fire begin to fall and let God consume it. If you've got bad feelings in this house, let us let the fire of God fall and consume it. If you're battling addictions today, let the fire of God fall and consume it. If you've got worry or stress or anxiety in your life, we'll build an altar and let the fire of God fall and let God consume that out of your life today. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise in this house.